radio broadcast of New Baptist Church located at 1628 Street in Huntington. You could join us this morning at 11 o'clock for our morning worship service. Uh, um, you could join us on live stream if you can't get out. It's a glorious Sunday morning. It just feels totally like spring this morning. So come out and get a breath of fresh air and join us at 11 o'clock for our morning worship service. If you can't, we're still on live stream at newbaptistchurch.com where you could join us there. Wednesday evenings, we have services that start at 6.30 with Awana and youth group that start at 6 o'clock. And you could come join us for any of those. Um, Carl, Robin, one of you want to lead us in prayer? Let us pray. Good morning, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for the glorious day you blessed us with, Lord. And we just thank you for a glorious time you've given to us. We can come to your house. Lord, we just thank you for each one of us is here. Lead and guide us, Lord, as we walk day with you. Our Heavenly Father, most of all, the time, you know, where you died on the cross for our sins, but you were risen the third day, and, and you are much alive in our hearts. We just thank you for that. Our Heavenly Father, just lead and guide us, watch over us, be with Pastor Robin as he brings the message, be with our special group this morning as they play the bells, Lord, that Everything do, Lord, glorify your name. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory forever. Amen. Now our handbell choir, multi-generational mm -hmm. handbell choir, all the way from second grade to, gotcha. we won't tell you what the top <laughs> age is. <laughs> all the way up there. It's not 99, so we're, we're good to go. We're playing holy, holy, holy.
Plain Church if you want to hear it again and see it live. Come 7 o'clock. Our morning message is Pastor Robin. Well, good morning again and welcome. Uh, let me add my word of welcome to Sherry's and uh, thank you to the bell choir. Uh, I have this ringing in my ears and it's a uh, melody of ringing. So uh, thank you. And uh, they are now moving and taking everything down to the sanctuary. So if there's a little commotion, uh, that's all right. But again, let me welcome you to the radio Bible class of New Baptist Church here in Huntington. I am Robin Crouch, one of the pastors here at New Baptist, and we're pleased to welcome you to our weekly uh, broadcast. If you don't have a church home here in Huntington, uh, let me invite you to join our in-person worship at 11 o'clock, please, each Sunday. Uh, and we're located at 610 28th Street. Uh, if you come down Fifth Avenue, get to 28th Street, there's the uh, uh, speedway on the corner. Just turn right there and Come on back, you'll see the church. It's the old skating rink. Uh, used to be there and across from the old East High School. On Wednesdays, again, as Sherry shared, our Awana for children, our youth ministry begins at 6, and our adult Bible studies at 6.30. And this class and each Sunday morning service uh, is available uh, for you on our church YouTube page. It can be accessed through the church website at newbaptistchurch.com. Today, we continue our series of lessons from the book of Ephesians, from Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. Last week, we looked at, in part of chapter 4, at Paul's calling for the Ephesian believers to pursue unity in their diversity. And today, we continue with Paul's exhortation about how these new believers are to walk with the Lord. Now, in chapters 1 to 3 of his letter and understand it, it's a for Paul it's just a letter for us uh, they we uh, separated into chapters and verses and and so when we talk like that we talk as almost as if Paul had written it that way and that's not it it's just a letter the way you and I would write one uh, but we've divided it so that we can find places and, and see what's going on and in chapters one to three of what we have uh, they have uh, Paul laid out a theological foundation uh, for the believers and for the church. In chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, uh, it, that is a transition. Uh, and it's a transition uh, from the theological to the more practical side of all that we have here and following Jesus. And Paul calls that the Christian walk. When I think about how this letter is laid out, then uh, I find that if chapters 1 to 3, uh, without the rest of the book, might lead to an idea of what has been called cheap grace, meaning that God just kind of winks at sin and lets everybody in and nothing changes in me. But without chapters 1 to 3, then the rest of this uh, become just a list of rules and regulations. A works-based salvation uh, and the relationship with the Lord is missed. That relationship is missed. Sad thing is that too many Christians I know today fall into that second fallacy. Is that they see our Christian faith as simply a list of rules uh, and uh, they miss the relationship uh, with God. In fact, they think that if they can do them and if they can just check them off the list, then somehow God owes them something because of what they did. It's that transactional kind of uh, a relationship uh, or a contractual agreement. You know, you do this if I do this. And so we think that if I do this, then God has to do something else. Uh, that is the easy way because I don't have to think. I don't have to discern. I have, just have to do what someone else tells me to do. But there's no relationship with God in that. 
And that's the problem if I only have the last part of chapter of Ephesians without the first part. So here we come now to the end of chapter four, and we're going to look at how Paul says we need to live out these things in relationship with God and with each other. So open your copy of God's word to Ephesians chapter four, and we're gonna start reading in verse 17. And Paul writes it this way. He said, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Pray with me. Father, I give you thanks. I thank you for your word for what it means, oh God, for how Paul teaches and encourages and exhorts. I thank you, you never let us off the hook. And so God, use your word in us today, open our spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have for us, and then open our hearts to understand it. And oh God, give us courage in our wills to obey you. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Well, Paul starts out and he says that we're not to, not to live or act like the Gentiles. And the Ephesian believers are Gentiles. And Paul writes to them knowing this. And here he tells them not to walk as Gentiles walk. Well, what does he mean? You know, he, he looks at them. He says, you all are Gentiles and, and don't be Gentiles. Don't act like that. It is almost as if. He looks at us and, uh, you know, write to us and says, y'all are West Virginians, but don't act like it. What's he mean? Well, he certainly, uh, it certainly, certainly have not suddenly become Jews. We didn't just certain, just automatically become something else. Uh, they're, they are now, but, but here, the Ephesians were now something different, a new creation not bound by the old way. And, 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 and if you speak to us, it is, yeah, we're still West Virginians, but we are different. We're a new creation. We're not bound by old traditions. Paul then appeals to his converts to, to leave their old way of life and turn to Christ's way. <clears throat> Here, Paul picks out what he considers the essentials of a Christless life. And in this, in these next couple of verses, Paul uses uh, three uh, words that paint a terrible picture of their life condition or predicament without Christ. The first word he uses is a word that where we would use for, for petrifying, it, it comes from a word that means stone hard or harder than marble. It is a, uh, and he talks about the petrifying effect that it has on the heart, that it sears or kills the conscience, explains some sins and a lack of remorse from those things. But our hearts get hard. Nothing can penetrate them. Nothing can change them. He then uses another word, and it's a word for shameless wantonness, incapable of bearing the pain of discipline, meaning that we are just at our own desires and we're just wild. We cannot control ourselves or our desires. It's the loss of dignity and shame. Uh, those things no longer have any effect on us. It's, it's like the alcoholic who doesn't care who sees him drunk uh, or other addictive behaviors and 
You just get to where you just don't care who sees you that way. Now, I know a lot of closet alcoholics who drink and, and, and don't want anybody to know or, or don't show signs of that. Well, this word says it's gone way beyond that. They don't care who sees them or in whatever condition they find themselves. Another word is for arrogant greediness. The desire of possessing for possessing sake, just more and more and more. It's the unlawful desire for wanting the things that belong to someone else is to take and take and take. The irresistible desire to have what we want and what we have no right to possess. The unbridled concern for the satisfaction of our own desires. Now, did you catch that? He says our hearts are hard. They have been petrified, harder than marble. Nothing penetrates them. We have a, a wantonness, a shamelessness about us. And we have an arrogant greediness. Somehow we deserve this and so we'll take what we want. Boy, is that not, is that not a description of our culture? Paul then reminds the Ephesian believers that that is who they were and not who they are to be in Christ. He goes on to say, you didn't learn that from, from Christ. You didn't learn the old way from Christ. So they are to put it away and exchange it for a new way of life in Christ because our new life is created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now think about that. Our old life is gone. Paul said it in Corinthians this way. You know, uh, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. In every sense of the word. And so here, we've been told that the old is gone. Put it off. Lay it aside. The new has come. Put it on. Take it on. Live this way. Paul has just told us in what we read to put on the new self and to put off the old self. So let's continue reading and see what he means by that. Starting in verse 25. He says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, that each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and all wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Wow, what words. What words. Paul here outlines the things we are to put off that are characteristic of the old self and what things to put on that are correct, characteristic of our new self. Look at what he says to put off. He says, put off falsehood of any kind. A lie in speech, whether intentional or unintentional. The lies of silence, not speaking when we should or withholding a warning. Put off all falsehood. You know, I would rather, now I'm going to say something pretty controversial. I would rather work and deal with someone who doesn't know Jesus who's honest and will speak the truth 
than someone who claims to be a Christian and speaks in falsehoods. You see, falsehood, lies, and deceit part of our old life, our old nature. It's not who we are to be. And here, Paul says we need to put it off. We need to speak the truth with our neighbors because we're one with another. We speak the truth. Now, that doesn't mean that we're mean and nasty. You know, I can speak the, roof, the, the word, the truth. And the proverb says that a gentle answer turns away wrath. I can speak the truth without being mean. I can do it without pointing a finger, that wagging a finger or making people think I'm better than they are. But I'm to put off falsehood. I'm to speak the truth. But he goes on. I'm to put off wrong anger, selfish and uncontrolled anger. You see, all of us have anger. We all get angry at times. We call it being mad. Uh, you know, when I get, you know, when I think of something being mad, I think of foaming at the mouth and stuff. And so I'll just, we'll call it anger the way the scripture does. But sometimes we all have anger. But we need to learn to be angry about the right things and to put off the wrong anger. You see, Jesus was angry with the Pharisees, with their pride. You see, he was angry for the right reason. It's all right for you to be angry when you see somebody mistreating someone else and to speak to it. We're to be angry when we see sin controlling other people. There is a righteous anger. The sad thing is most often our anger is selfish because we didn't get what we wanted or we thought somebody wronged us or we thought this or that. And so we get mad, but it's all motivated by our self-interest. And Paul says, we got to put that off. That kind of anger will eat you alive. See, a bad temper, irritability are without defense. Paul says, nope, can't do it. John Wesley said it this way. He said, you give me a hundred men who fear nothing but God and hate nothing but sin and know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified and I will shake the world. Who know nothing but Christ, who hate nothing but sin. Not the sinner, but the sin. But I put away wrong anger. Also must put off Festering wrath. It says, dot to let the sun go down on your anger. That means deal with it. Take care of it. You see, as I let anger rest in me, it just festers. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And I get more angry and more angry. And then I lash out. And Paul here says, no, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it. Deal with it. My first church, I served as pastor. My installation, my uncle, who was a pastor here in West Virginia, did the installation. In fact, I had two uncles who were pastors, and they both participated. But Ward Robinson was my mother's brother and my uncle, and he looked at me during that time, and and he looked and he and he just and in front of the whole church, he said, "Robin, here are three things you need to do to be able to stay at a church a long time." He said, first. Show respect to every person. Second, said you'll have favorites, but you can't play favorites. Said and third, you deal with conflict immediately. Don't let it fester. I practiced those three things in the 25 years that I was uh, a senior pastor. And I can say confidently, not that we didn't have conflicts, but we never had anything come to the surface that the church that threatened to split the church or that threatened uh, relationships. Because when there was a conflict, I went and dealt with it. If I had offended someone, I went and told them I was sorry. If I thought someone was out of line in church, I went and talked to them about it. 
Why? Because it can't let that anger fester. It eats you alive. You deal with it quickly with quarrels and differences. The longer we wait to mend, the less likely we are to do it, less likely we are to do it, and the greater the bitterness becomes. And in this, we give the devil an opportunity to destroy what God has created and built. Then he says, put away theft, especially in our work. An honest day's work for your pay, when too many people are sneaking away or doing this or wasting time, be a person of integrity. Work not just for yourself or your family, but so that you might have some to share with those in need. That's what he says. Put away theft. He then says, put away foul mouth language. No unwholesome word, he says. Rather, use speech that builds up and edifies. You know, there's much said in Scripture about speech. It's never allowed to destroy with speech, but always it calls us to build up. And do you know the Bible speaks more about the misuse of the tongue than any other sin? There's great punishment for those who misuse the tongue. And Paul says, Put away foul mouth language. Use words that build up and don't tear down. He says, put away a proud spirit, that which grieves the Holy Spirit. Acting contrary to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, both ignoring his leading and ascribing to his leading things that are not from him. Understand this, the Holy Spirit will never lead you contrary to God's word. Put away bitterness, he says, because it eats you alive. Put away outbursts of passion or long-lived anger. Put away insulting speech. And then he says to put on these things. You put those things off, then you put on these. These are what are characteristic of following Jesus. Kindness, compassion, forgiveness. Too many Christians I know are going around wearing the old clothes of when we walked in darkness. Sometimes I wonder if they really met Jesus or not. Sometimes we resemble in our actions and desires those who don't know Jesus at all. I'm not suggesting that we are perfect, but we should be faithful. Those who follow Jesus are recognizable because they are so different from the world around us. Now, I'm not saying that people cannot be moral uh, but I wonder how pure their motivations are. I want to be with people, but I want to be like Jesus. So let's put on the new self and live as, live as Jesus desires us to live. Pray with me. Father, I give you thanks for a good day. I thank you for your word. Now teach us to take off, to put off those things that are not like you and to put on the things that let people know we're yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.